Good afternoon, Money.net. We've got Don Dawson from Bar Chart. Uh, how are you, Don? Doing good. How about yourself? I'm good. You know, very simple. Uh, there's been a lot of FUD in this market going on, and it just seems to me that uh, everybody's running around like Chicken Little today. Uh, am I right or wrong about this? I, I think you got that down right. I think this news has gotten to be its so emotional right now that there's a lot of people chasing this news, and this news is going to abate at some point, and they're going to get left going like, uh, we're, we're where is everybody you know so yeah you, know, you, you have to boat. ask the question this is probably the first big uh twitter time right where we we're actually looking at fud and just how fast the speed of uh the fud is going around right now um you know one of the things that we've been talking about here you and i have been talking about is the precious metals markets and gold um i made a mistake last week when we talked that time i said i was going to be buying some silver and um, I just didn't pull the trigger. And uh, my goodness, I should have done it. It'd be already up 10%. Yeah. Um, but uh, I didn't. Uh, what are you seeing in the gold markets here? You know, it, it's probably a good thing you didn't buy it. Because I assume that would have been because you were talking about doing the bullion or the, the physical, yeah. I believe. So, and you'd have to hold that for a while just to make, because you couldn't turn around and flip that with the bid and ask and that. That's of right. Thing. Yeah. So, so, but anyway, uh, it's probably a good thing you didn't. But uh, let me let me just pull up a screen share. Sure. Here, and I'll, uh, here we go. Here's your screen. So basically what I got here is a seasonal pattern on our gold market. I just want to point this out right here. Yeah, here we go. Let me get a full screen. That way everybody can see it a little bit better. What this is, it's a, a spread chart. Uh, I'm sorry, a seasonal chart of uh, the gold uh, market, if you will. And what I've got on here to start with is black and a red line. The black is a 15-year history of the market and uh, pattern throughout the year from basically January through December. Mm -hmm. The pink or whatever is a 30 year. So that's our 30 and 15 year. I left a five off. That one's a little bit noisy. But what I wanted people to see here was that over the last 30 and 15, how closely correlated they are staying, right? I mean, the 30 to 15. A lot of our markets are starting, not a lot, but some of our markets are starting to see these diverge to 15s and the 30s because of mm -hmm. the way the economy is changing, the way the markets are using particular commodities and stuff. So we're starting to see a little bit of a divergence, which means these seasonality patterns are going to shift a little bit left or right during the year. And that's where I just wanted to point this out about how consistent gold stays cyclically or seasonally. All right, that's the purpose of this. Now, if I get rid of the 30, it brings us back to just a 15 year, which is what most people use for coming up with seasonality. And, you know, it's this is more research puts this information out on, on our website. And then also you can subscribe and so on like that as well. But back in here is what we just finished up was this big rally right here. This is the one I wrote just an article for Bar Chart back in December, get bullish on gold because we got this big rally coming up. And I was really more bullish on it this year because of how the Chinese government was talking about they're going to relax to COVID. And if you remembered how the U.S. was when they finally let us out of COVID, it, there was a buying spree that went on for, I mean, people were buying anything they could get their hands on pretty much. And the Chinese were going to be no different because they had on such a strict lockdown. And sure enough, this year it played out and played right in into it. So, you know, you get the Christmas holidays, you've got the uh, India wedding season, everything coming in all through here. And then yep. up here at the peak was the blow off from the, the Chinese New Year. All right. And that was just a spectacular one this year. People were just like, get me out of the house kind of a thing. And it really worked well. So now look what's happened though. This is our February peak back up in here. And then you'll notice here, this is what we do now until we get into this May or I say June, July timeframe. And we get this gasp up in here until about the end of August. And then we start down into the December again, and we'll start this over again. My point is, what we're going to talk about here today, we are into a chop session right here. But if you look at this peak period or this period right in here is March right here. Look at the date, March 18th, March. It's all coinciding with these little spikes up that we have here. But what does it do historically after we get these spikes back here? Sure, the news has something to do with this, you know, the spike that we're seeing in gold and silver and so on right now. Yep. However, with that going on, there's also a seasonal tendency for that spike to happen too. And it just be careful with this. So many gold traders get sucked into these rallies because they think they're missing it. And they just want to jump in going like, yeah, but that's different this time. Yeah, but. And they come up with all these reasons to support chasing the market. And it's really a big mistake, I think, at this time of the year, to tell you the truth. If you really want to get bullish on something, try and get these times where you got these really solid cyclical patterns coming in, then go up and chase. I mean, this is fine for a day trader if somebody wants to go in there and chase the market around intraday. But if you're really looking to buy something, hold on to it for a couple of days to weeks and maybe months, then why get in here and get all chopped up during this time? But my point is, I just want you guys to see this pattern right here and take you out here to the next thing here. And, and this is the gold chart. 
<clears throat> so I want to point this one out. And this is the gold chart price action that we're seeing here recently. Mm -hmm. Let's back this up in here. And you can see back over here, there was this December. There we go. Here's that December rally. I was talking about December all the way right up here to February. And we peaked out and boom, now we're coming back down into that what sloppy choppy session there. So what I wanted to point out here is this thing down here at the bottom, this is the open interest. Now, remember in futures markets, open interest re re represents the number of positions that have been entered into, but not yet offset. So these have nothing to do with day trades. These are only for positions held overnight, which is what your big traders are trading, overnight positions, because they're trying to capitalize on time on their side and making more money. But I wanted to point this out. If this line is going up, that means there's due more new positions coming into the market as it goes up, you know, up or down. As it goes up, that's typically bullish because that's new buying coming into the market. Okay, and in a downtrend, if open interest is going up, that's good because there's still new selling coming in. All right, now it takes a new buyer and a new seller to make open interest go up one. Okay, if you have both, like if you have open interest to go down, what that means is both parties, the long and the short of that contract, are liquidating positions, not putting new ones on, but liquidating. So what I wanted to point out here was, here's that low that we had a couple of days ago, and this has been the last three or four days, sort of hee -hee, euphoria, whatever's going on with that. But look what's happening here. We came up to here, and remember, open interest is a reflection of the prior day. So particular up here, this day, like yesterday, it was a down open interest liquidating. This big day right here, look at that. We actually went down in open interest, not up on a big up day like that, Okay. Same thing happened over here. That day right there was the day we got to, I guess that was the first day of the news breaking. And we get to rush in, new buying, new selling coming in right here. But look what these last two days have done. I can't wait to see what this, this day is going to show right here. Okay. So for me, this open interest, should, open interest should have been doing a couple of days spikes like this. If this is really solid new buying coming in here to support this rally in the market, in my opinion. Um yeah, I mean, when you, when you look at gold in general, you see 1920, 1950, that area seems to be a, a, a business area where people are actually wanting to dump some of their their gold because they've been they bought it so cheaply over the last uh, over the last yearish. Correctly, um, yeah, and I mean, you look back here. You can just look back here. Here's a picture of the chart. That same yeah. area you're talking about, that 1950, but you're getting so close to that 2000 area back here. That's just a huge, huge area of supply in this market. So, and what do you what do you think it's going to take to push it over the 2000 hump? Um, wow. You know, I I've been telling people I'm not the fan of gold going to 5000 and 10000 like people think it's going to do. I, I think gold has lost its luster simply because of how many different assets we now have to put money in. And I was talking to somebody the other day, he was a, another floor trader, and I'd mentioned to him, uh, same thing. And when we were you know, trading back in the days of 80s and maybe early 90s, there was only like nine different things you could put your money in. I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but very few things to put your money in to really invest or to um, sort of hedge, if you will. Today, look at all the different things that we have out there. You know, I mean, you got cryptos out there. You've got, uh, you know, obviously gold still around, but interest rate products that can be put into all kinds of ETFs. There's all kinds of different ways, you know, real estate ETFs to hedge an inflation period. Who would have thought, you know, 20 years ago, who would have thought something like that would come along? My point being is now when there's panic in the market, you're not seeing everybody jump on the bandwagon to buy gold. There's still the old gold bugs. They're never going away. And they're going to you know, talk up gold. But most times when you hear people talking up gold, they have it to sell and they want to get rid of it. Right. So it's the old pump and dump kind of a thing. And we have a comment from Namita here in, the, in our Scott chat asking, saying, saying that central banks are piling up on gold. Are you seeing that the sovereign wealth funds, bigger funds piling into the gold markets? I, you know, I can't say that I'm personally following that. I've heard the stories on that, uh, you know, that I, but I don't have any proof that, you know, that's actually going on. It, it could very well be. Um, it would probably be more like third world countries. But the, the one thing about it is, too, is if you if you see a central bank buying up too much gold, what does it do to their currency? You see, there's really no motivation for right. a bank or a central bank to buy gold. 
Right. Right. So see, that makes it a little bit suspicious in my mind. As a matter of fact, central banks love to hedge in the gold market. They're some of the biggest sellers up at these higher prices. They're not sitting on, they're not like a SVB or whatever, where they're not hedged. All right. They're not sitting there holding billions of dollars of gold and not hedging that stuff. Right. Uh Because they're technically long gold. Right. So they want to hedge it. So I think for me, I would just leave it at, uh, for my my view, I I just don't know 100% sure, but I've just always been under the impression that central banks hate gold simply because it uh, makes their currency to get weaker and let's talk about other uh other commodities especially the big one right now being talked about and that's obviously the oil markets wti oil now below the 70 handle here's 6839 um you know we've been we've been hearing from the spr from the government saying every time we're we're getting down there under uh, under 72 they've been buying yeah. and today they maybe they had too much on their minds they didn't buy any gold they didn't buy any, buy any oil today yeah yeah i had heard they had different levels like one was 80 one was 75 then they had 70 but when it was almost like the the novice trader it's like i'm going to buy it at 80 but as they watched those big red candles coming down they go, oh no it's not going to stop and they yank the order and go let's put it in five dollars less and then the same thing and when they hit 70 they go, oh let's pull the order so you know i wouldn't be surprised if they're not doing something like that they're not locked in just because they tell you when did the government I'll tell the truth anyway just because they say they're going to buy something at 70 who knows where they're going to buy it i'm just happy they're going to start replenishing it if they are that's the main thing um, the other thing i just wanted to point out here is on this on gold today yeah um, if you look at the prices up here, here's gold's net change. And then down here is silver. Now, I wrote this article, and we talked about this on your show not long ago. Yep. That when there's this kind of a divergence, gold or silver is not supporting this rally that we're seeing today. Low interest, or, I'm sorry, low open interest the other days on this market. Things are not looking good on the bull side. So this right here, uh, from a percentage wise, I had it on my other screens. Gold is up like 1%. Silver's down half a percent today on this so-called big news day insiders or who, if that's who you want to call them, bigger traders are probably selling into this rally more than buying it because if they were buying it that open interest would have been accumulating over the last few days so so anyway just kind of wanted to bring that up that there's some kind of a divergence going on here silver and gold uh and remember we just talked about silver just kind of like gold's uh stepchild if you will it's like it it, it plays well with others silver and gold get along well for a while and all of a sudden silver goes darting off this away and then gold's got to go to catch up with it and that's typically what we see in this market so this could be that first sign of divergence in this rally that uh, is going to be a sign of weakness so yeah if- and so what about we are now getting into the spring it's march i know that it's a little cooler up there than it is down here um <laughs> What about the planting season, corn, wheat? Where are we now getting in that planting season? That's interesting. I was just getting ready to write an article on that. And oh. uh, I'd known you were, I was going to actually have that thing written today. Was it? I mean, old, you know, we're old commodities traders, old futures traders. We we know when the planting season I starts. Totally right? know. And we are coming into a beautiful pattern here. Um, I, I wish I had my chart set up to give you some better examples. Um, well, I, I'll tell you what I can do here. Let me pop this up here really quick and futures take your time yeah we're good the commitment of traders report is finally coming back online i'm not blind trading anymore i'm like we've we've caught up until the third of march which would have been the first week of uh you know march and now we've just got last week to get and then this friday's and then we'll be if you could could you please explain to those who don't know what cots is or commitment of traders to the to our our users certainly let me i'll open the chart and makes it a little bit more easier to uh, do that and here's the corn market right here So down here at the bottom, there's four lines, but we're really only interested in two, all right? And the two that we want to pay attention to is right here, the commercials and producers, merchants, and the other one is your non-commercial managed money. So swap dealers, other reportables, we really don't care about, but the red and the, um, I guess that's a black or whatever it is, I'm sorry, yeah, blue, blue. I'm sorry, I've got my screen turned way down so I look like a black. But anyway, what this is measuring is the open interest of each of these. And and each of these entities right here trade such large positions that every week they have to report or their their clearing firms have to report their positions to the CFTC. So what it's doing is it's tracking who's really in control of this market, who's got the uh, positions in the market. So the COT is a very, it's like, it can be used as a sentiment indicator. It can also be used as a trend following tool. Uh, But what is best, I think, is that some of these turning points in the market of when to really get anxious about a market. And that's why I'm willing to bring this up and show you, because you mentioned corn. But we are getting ready for a nice rally in corn, I believe. And and the reason I'm saying that is, let me pull this as a three-year. I usually look at like a one-year of this 
And we call it, it's a one year look back. Okay. So this is going back one whole year and the report comes out once a week. So if you look at this, this is your commercial entities down here. And if you look at it, we've got a, there, this little tick up right here on the first week of March, which was on actually February 28th, so reporting day. They are the most or the least bearish because they are under that. So they're at minus 292,000 net short position. However, that's the least short they have been in a year. Okay. Mm. And you got managed money is up here. And now they had this big down tick as well. Now, usually managed money is trend following. All right. And the commercials are the ones who make these bottoms, just like we talked about this on your show not long ago. Back in here, this was a seasonal pattern. It played out so well because why? Commercials had a very, very low short position. All right. And so this would be like processors of corn. It could be grain elevators having to buy it, for example, for feed in the wintertime. It could be ethanol uh, refiners buying it. Any, any reason that they would be buying this stuff right here. But the point is, when you see buying at this time of the year, it's not unusual. And if we go back, matter of fact, let me just pull this up really quick here. Let me show you what corn normally does here, because this is it's a perfect time. And this is where media comes into play as well, because the grain markets are no exception to having the uh, noise out there uh, to promote rallies so that they can get short. Because you're going to hear a lot of news now coming out in the next couple of weeks talking about this, about how bad the weather is, how bad exports are, how bad, how bad, how bad. That's what we're going to be hearing over the next who knows how long until we get to this. This peak right here is June, July. Okay, This is like the peak of the planting season. And look what it does all the way into October, the harvest season. That's the 15-year history right there, okay? every It's almost like this, because you put the crops in the ground at the same time, and you take them out at the same time. Very, very cyclical pattern here. However, we're right here, April, March, in this March time frame here, okay? So you see, what we're going to see is a little bit more choppiness here. But did you notice how short the commercials were? I'm getting rid of their short, so they were getting more and more bullish, Right. And they've been gradually doing that through this choppy period right here in corn. OK, then when we get into this first of April, that's when we're going to start seeing this moves up into April through the May or say June time frame. It's, this is just a rally into the planting season. So if you imagine if you're a producer and somebody's interviewing you on a radio or something or wherever, and you are not going to sit there and talk about like, oh, we think it's going lower they because they want to talk to price up. They're going to say everything that's going to be bullish for crop prices, okay? Whether it's true or not, they're just going to keep on putting it out there. And people, especially algorithms that trade news and chase news, manage money even, will keep buying this market and pushing it up. And then we get right into that peak and there will be so much selling that comes in from the producers of these commodities. We go right back into the same thing because the market's always looking forward. Okay, And, it's, and it seems that it's so cold up north lately that they can't even get to the planting yet. Right. You know, and that could be that could turn us into a different issue. Uh, I haven't heard of any. It's, it's still definitely way too early to be planting. And don't forget, there's two planting areas in the United States. We have the southern hemisphere and then also uh, not southern hemisphere, the southern part of the, southern the part, state, yeah, right. the country. And then we got the northern part. And what you're referring to up there is, you know, that frost line that comes down all out of the uh, Arctic. That does make the ground a lot harder in certain areas of the Corn Belt that you can't get into the field and get it planted in it, you know, as early as you can, say, down in Louisiana, Georgia, places. And have you there. have you heard, John, lately? Is it corn or is it soybeans or is it wheat? What are we what are we planting the most of this year? Corn. Corn is going to be the one that comes in super fast. Great article I just reposted on LinkedIn this week, uh, this past weekend, and that fertilizer prices have dropped something like 15 to 20 percent, mm. making it much more affordable for planting. So right. this is going to be the year when I used to ride my motorcycle out in the country and stuff. I used to always tell how good the crop year was going to be, just how, how close to farmers put their corn to the road. So it was like if it was going to be a bumper crop, you saw rows literally at the edge of the road, right? They were even putting them in the ditches. It just give me some land to plant corn on. And that's what we're going to see this year. There's going to be so much more just give me some land and replace the soybean planting most likely or some of it with that. At the end of this month, uh, we have the planting intentions coming out on 31st. And that's going to be, uh, I think it'll start revealing some of that more corn than soybeans. More so, corn than soybeans. Got it. Okay. John Dawson, bar chart, uh, Mr. Futures himself. Thanks so much, Don. We'll see you right back here next week, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Look forward to coming back. Take care, everybody.